This is the frozen surface of the farthest reaches of the Arctic Ocean. 60 below in the spring. Sunless through the long night of winter. A mass of chilling, freezing slush in summer. The Arctic Ocean, called a useless, impenetrable sea yesterday, called the crossroads of the world today, an area of vital interest to the Navy and a rich source of oil and mineral wealth for the country. The United States Navy has been studying the Arctic for well over a century. In 1850, American naval vessels entered the Arctic from the Atlantic Ocean, officially in an effort to find Sir John Franklin, a British explorer, but also in search of the fabled Northwest Passage through the Pacific. In 1879, the USS Jeannette entered from the Pacific through Bering Strait on a scientific mission to trace Arctic currents and to reach the North Pole. Six months later, she became trapped in the ice and drifted helplessly northwestward to her doom. Most of the men died, but two years later, after one of the most terrible ordeals in history, a pitiful handful of survivors from the crushed ship struggled across the ice to the Siberian coast. Naval officers sent to retrieve Jeanette bodies and relics took a route that eventually led them overland to Point Barrow. Meanwhile, the Jeanette wreckage drifted on around the pole until portions were found on the southern coast of Greenland. Five years after her expedition started, Jeanette's remains had finally proved the circular motion of the polar sea. Then came Peary probing the Arctic for the Navy from Greenland to the Pole and started a quarter century of ice research. In 1926, Berg, the naval aviator, became first to reach the North Pole by air. Research and exploration, a historic base for the Navy's presence in the Arctic. Oil was another base. Oil found seeping from the ground at Cape Simpson on the Arctic coast in 1917. 37,000 square miles of Alaska's North Slope were set aside by Congress in 1923 as a naval petroleum reserve to safeguard fuel for a fleet newly converted from coal. An oil exploration camp was set up near Barrow, America's northernmost town. And in 1947, this camp, our only naval establishment on the Arctic, was selected by the Office of Naval Research as the site of its first Arctic experiment. Seven scientists arrived, and the Arctic Research Laboratory was born in two rented Quonset huts. From those seven men in two huts, from all the scientists who later worked at the Office of Naval Research Laboratory, has come most of today's knowledge about the Arctic Ocean, most of the knowledge that allows man to live and work along its shores. The Navy studies have had great impact on fleet operations in the Arctic. Our nuclear submarines move safely beneath the ice pack because their inertial navigation systems can be corrected by standards set in laboratory studies of Arctic oceanography. The submarines can now enter the Arctic through Bering Strait because the scientists of the laboratory discovered the deep water Barrow Sea Canyon, previously unknown. They can surface through thin spots in the ice pack because the laboratory scientists have learned how to find these spots. Those same ice studies helped make possible the experimental voyage of the ice-breaking tanker Manhattan through the Northwest Passage. Stretching from Alaska to Greenland, the distant early warning system, known as the dew line, was possible because of Navy-developed techniques to insulate the ground and the permafrost beneath from building heat. From these techniques, came methods of insulating and air conditioning, which made possible the Alaska Pipeline, the largest privately financed project in history. A report by the Department of the Interior concluded 
that the Navy's Arctic research saved two years in preparing for the pipeline. Two years, which means at least 800 million extra barrels of oil, a saving of at least $10 billion in foreign exchange. I'm Dr. Warren Denner, director of the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory located at the northern tip of Alaska, Point Barrow. The laboratory is a national laboratory operated by the Navy in support of all phases of Arctic science. New discoveries are being made every day in the Arctic and they impact on every part of our activity and its development. Many factors influence sound in the ocean. Sound waves are bent by variations in temperature and salinity. Sound is absorbed within the body of the water column and on its reflection at the surface and the bottom. Particulate matter and organisms in the water scatter sound, and noise at a given location interferes with its reception. We understand these factors very, very poorly in most of the ice-covered regions of the world, particularly in the Arctic Basin. The sea, the land, the atmosphere, the creatures that live here, all are subjects of study. But the frozen surface and water beneath are the prime targets of the Navy's scientists. The sea ice is in constant motion, grinding and crashing against itself, developing leads of open water and closing them again. The ice pack constantly growing and shrinking and growing again. For 12 years, Navy oceanographers studied these movements from a permanent station on Ice Island T3, drifting around the pole with the circular currents of the North Polar Basin. Then the Ice Island grounded north of Greenland. They also studied the Arctic Ocean from seven shorter-lived ice flow stations, one of which was Arles II. In March 1975, a new phase of Arctic research began. The Arctic Ice Dynamics Joint Experiment, called AJEX, conducted from a group of ice stations. This project is sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research, with participation by other government agencies, both American and Canadian. Over a hundred scientists from many institutions are working together to develop a capability to predict ice movements in the Arctic. AJEX has welded them into a single coordinated team given them technical and logistic support, and now is sending them out onto the ice pack 400 miles from Barrow for 14 months of solid work. I'm Norbert Untersteiner, University of Washington and uh, program director for AJAX. The concept of all this came from a report that I helped write six years ago for the Office of Naval Research. AJAX is a study of the interaction between sea ice the atmosphere and the ocean, including methods of forecasting deformation and its effects on the heat balance. None of this would have been possible without the help of NARA, the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory at Barrow. We expect AJAX to give us the knowledge to forecast ice movement and the development of ice features. This might mean commercial shipping year-round across the Arctic Basin, safer submarine operations and the safe installation of permanent structures near shore. We also expect that this project will deepen our insight into the role of sea ice in world climate. Out on the ice, the Ajax experiment begins. A main camp is surrounded by three smaller camps, each about 50 miles away. The four camps are circled by automatic data buoys, marking the AJAX area of study. The camps receive position data from the Navy navigation satellite system. The location of each unit and data buoys can be determined at any moment by calculating latitude, longitude, and azimuth. Any change in the position of the entire array, or of even one unit in relation to the others, is thus revealed yielding data on acceleration and velocity of movement of all units. Atmospheric measurements, wind, temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, are gathered for later analysis, as are all oceanographic measurements.
long-range aircraft from the Naval Oceanographic Office, assisted by others from NASA and the Canadian services, fly over the Ajax area regularly, recording the varying amounts of open water, changing ice features, and even ice thickness by remote sensing devices ranging from aerial cameras, or clear weather observation, to infrared scanners, special radars, and optical lasers. A rotating flow of scientists make other measurements. Radiation, heat exchange, stresses, magnetism, gravity. And all are fed to the computer to be stored, analyzed, and explained over years of study. Support of the AJEX program is just one activity of the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory. At its Barrow facility, on the nearby ice pack, and in 14 field stations from the Canadian border to Bering Strait, the Office of Naval Research plays host to many scientists working on other projects important to the Navy and to the nation. Oil and ice, a vital field of study in the Arctic today. What happens if there's an oil spill on the ice? If there is, how do you combat it? Amy Horowitz of the University of Kentucky is testing bacterial biodegraders as possible cleanup agents. In effect, I'm trying to find bacteria that will eat the oil. These little fellows are nibbling, but their appetites aren't big enough. I think we'll find an Arctic organism which will degrade the oil before it will melt the ice. Three thousand miles from the Arctic, in Santa Barbara, California, Another scientist, Dr. Beaumont Buck of the Polar Research Laboratory, specializes in acoustics. The submarine is the most important and effective weapon system that the military has in ice-covered seas. The submarine, however, has limitations like all manned systems. And these are primarily related to their sensors. In the case of the submarine, this is sonar. In turn, sonar is limited by certain oceanographic environmental parameters. Propagation, in other words, how well does sound transmit from point A to point B? And background noise. Now, these noises are caused by movement of the ice. Pressure ridging, when two flows come together. Lead formation, when they go apart. And two ice pans grinding one on another. All of these cause noises that are quite high in level and interfere with sonars, the ears of the submarine. We have found that the only reasonable measurement program is one that is spread out and over a wide geographic area and covers a very long period of time to cover all of the seasons in the Arctic. I'm Dick Heimann, resident technician for Polar Research Laboratory at NOW. We specialize in acoustics and we use explosive charges to test underwater sound propagation and to study ice conditions that interfere with propagation. Here is a recording taken 100 miles away and 200 miles away. We are concerned with interference to ice reverberations that distort the echoes from active sonar. Imagine the uproar created by a walrus chorus or by a herd of bowhead whales. Dr. Robert Bunny of the Point Barrow Laboratory is concerned with a newly discovered acoustic problem in cold water. His tests have shown that water at 59 degrees Fahrenheit gives a miniature echo sounder a sharp, clear echo. But when the water is chilled to 30 degrees, sonar range is reduced by 50%, indicating a significant reduction in the ability to detect sound. You can imagine what that means uh, to submarines operating under the ice. 
We run the same experiment full scale in the Arctic Ocean, checking sonar range and echo strength with different uh, uh, sound frequencies at various temperatures. But in the laboratory, we can control the variables of an, ex uh, of an experiment that we cannot control in the ocean. We know that this phenomenal reduction in sonar range occurs just above the freezing point of salt water. We don't know yet why it happens. We don't know how to overcome it, but we will. It's our kind of problem. The shoreline of the Arctic, too, presents problems unknown elsewhere. Distorted by the pressures of the ice pack through the fall and winter, mixed with frozen slush during the spring thaw, the beach, by summer, may present obstacles unknown the year before, and offshore sandbars may have appeared or disappeared. For several years, the beach at Icy Cape has been under observation by the Coastal Studies Institute of Louisiana State University, supported by the Office of Naval Research. Dr. Larry Rouse is one of the scientists involved. Yearly changes are measured along a beach grid. Sensing devices offshore and on the bottom report currents and wave and tide movements for coastal morphology studies. Scientists are learning to predict what the ice and the sea will do. If someone wants to put an oil well or some other structure on an offshore island, it is possible to determine whether or not it will wash away in five or ten years. If there is to be nearshore navigation, tankers or landing craft, it is possible to predict where there will be sandbars. If someone wants to use the beach, they can be told if it's likely to support traffic. We're at the point now where we can even look at the winter ice and tell the oil people or the Navy what to expect next summer. The fragile tundra is a subject of research too. This is a desert in terms of snowfall and rain, but almost every drop of water that falls stays here because there is no drainage. Within 18 inches of the surface, there is always the frozen ground, the permafrost, and above it, is the soil, soft and vulnerable when it's not frozen, and almost impenetrable when it is. The tundra near Barrow has been the focal point of a multi-year study by some 30 colleges and laboratories. The Tundra Biome Project has covered plant life on the tundra, aquatic life in the tundra ponds, and the position of animal life in the tundra ecosystem. Lemming blooms and lemming shortages are tied to the whole pace of animal and plant life on the tundra. The little rodents are under intensive study at the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory to determine what causes the great yearly variations in lemming population. Most of the animals which prey upon the lemming are here too. The Arctic snowy owl, the vicious little ermine, the bad-tempered wolverine, the Arctic fox, and the much maligned wolf. Most of the large animals are kept out of doors so scientists can discover how they are able to live in severe cold. They are left to burrow into the snow for warmth, as they would on the tundra. To learn how Arctic animals can survive and function at low temperatures requires detailed monitoring of their systems. Radio capsules are implanted in the animals and transmit body temperature and heart rate. Knowing the heart rate and the EKG of an Arctic animal makes it possible to calculate oxygen consumption. Similar measurements are taken from seals and polar bears as the scientists try to uncover any information to help man work and live safely in the Arctic. polar bear is of special interest to some scientists. My name is Jack Lenfer. I work out of the Barrel Laboratory studying polar bear life history and their movement patterns. Most bears are merely tagged so that their movement can be determined if they are recaptured or taken by hunters. This particular bear has been brought in from the ice so that a harness with a radio transmitter can be attached. This will allow the scientist to follow its movement for the 12-month life of the battery in the radio package. Dr. Arthur Callahan of the Point Barrel Laboratory 
is as close as any man to the Arctic wolf. They are fascinating animals, certainly the most intelligent of the Arctic mammals. One thing that we've learned here is that the tundra wolf, even when captured as a near adult, is of no danger to us. There's not a single proven case of a wolf attack on a man in North America. Several years ago, the laboratory released wolves in the Brooks Range to see if they would readapt to the wild. During this release, we put out food in ever smaller amounts for a two-month test period, and we're keeping the wolves under observation. The last time we did this, one wolf of the five traveled 160 miles in 119 days, and we found him scratching at his cage, trying to get in. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game are examining the life history and population status of the walrus. Other government agencies of the United States and Canada are studying the bowhead whale. The Arctic is still a land of mystery with marine life found nowhere else. Not long ago, scientists of the New York Aquarium of the New York Zoological Society came to the Arctic to study the strange narwhal. With its spiral tusks, the narwhal is truly the unicorn of the sea. The Solid Sea. The Soggy Land. The radiant exchange between sun and earth in the Arctic. All hold crucial significance for man. Alaska's North Slope may provide our fossil fuel for the next generation. And offshore, the Arctic Continental Shelf larger than our Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf Coast shelves combined, holds riches we can only imagine. Submarines routinely traverse the Arctic Ocean. Cargo submarine tankers will soon follow. Air cushion vehicles may one day cross the pole through ice and ocean in regular routes to Europe. The Naval Arctic Research Laboratory opens a window to the Arctic. The faith and dreams of the early explorers who struggled and died in their endless search have come true. The surge to the Arctic is at last underway, opening a new world for today and tomorrow.